It's the last edition for the week. Good morning and welcome to Business Morning. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank God it's Friday and thank you for joining us. Now let's take a look at what's in the news. All prices were mixed this Friday after a boost from a drop in U.S. crude and gasoline inventories. But we're still upset for a weekly decline on concerns that an OPEC plus impasse could swell global crude supplies. U.S. West Texas uh, Brent crude futures uh, were down nine cents at seventy-four dollars three cents a barrel. U.S. West Texas intermediate futures were up one cent at seventy-two dollars ninety-five cents a barrel. Both benchmarks were headed for a loss of nearly three percent for this week, as traders remained worried that the collapse of talks between uh, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and allies, including Russia. A group known as OPEC Plus could lead to a rise in crude supplies. The U.S. Energy Information Administration said on Thursday U.S. crude and gasoline stocks fell and gasoline demand reached its highest since 2019, signaling increase in strength in the U.S. economy. Crude inventories fell by 6.9 million barrels in the week to July 2 to 445.5 million barrels, the lowest since February 2020, and more than the expected 4 million barrel drop estimated. And uh, back here, the only way to effectively reduce the cost of cement in the country is to have more players in the subsector. And this is according to Mr. Abdul Samad Rabiu, the chairman of Boa Cement PLC, one of Nigeria's leading cement companies. He was speaking at the company's fifth annual uh, general meeting held in Abuja. Do take a listen. It's been a great year so far for one of Nigeria's leading cement companies, Boa Cement PLC. This fifth annual general meeting is to update shareholders on how the company has performed at the year ending 2020 and the auditors are satisfied with the books. The company's statement of financial position and statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income are in agreement with those books and returns. Bua Cement PLC is declaring a profit after tax of 72.3 billion naira, over 12 billion naira more than it declared in 2019, paying a higher dividend of 70 billion naira to shareholders, that is 2.067 naira per share of 50 kobo each, to the delight of the shareholders. Our products are still hot cake. They are in demand. You cannot go to any shop and see Bua Cement on ground. Because as soon as the trailer comes, People pack all. I want to commend the growth in our revenue by 19.35 percent, from 175 billion naira to 209 billion naira. Bua Cement managed to make more profits in a difficult 2020, while still adhering to its policy on social development and community improvement by giving charity to communities, totaling 753.7 million naira. The company's chairman wants more players in the cement industry if Nigeria is to meet the market demand, which will in turn drive down the price of cement in the country. If you look at what is happening in Egypt today, Egypt is producing 85 million tons of cement. The demand for cement in Egypt is just under 50 million tons. Hence the reason why Egypt today is probably, you know, has the cheapest you know, our price in terms of cement here in Africa. We should do the same, and I think government and you know should encourage more players because it's so critical, it's so important. And if you only if you have only three players and there is a problem or issue with any of the players, for whatever reason, you know I mean we'll see the price of cement going much higher than what it is today. Investors are rest assured that Boa Cement is poised to make them more profit come the end of 2021 as the company plans to mop up more limestone deposits, breaking ground in more parts of the country, and perhaps exceed the demand of 60 million tons of cement per year. And the Federal Inland Revenue Service has directed commercial banks in the country to freeze the accounts of Multi-Choice Nigeria Limited and Multi-Choice Africa in a bid to recover about 1.8 trillion naira outstanding taxes. In a statement released yesterday, the FIRS says it discovered that the companies persistently breached all agreements while the group's performance did not reflect in their tax obligation and compliance level in the country. And the FIRS further explains that the multi-choice uh, multi Africa, which provides services to its Nigerian subsidiary, had never paid value-added tax to the Nigerian government since its inception, even as the country contributes 34% of total revenue for the multi-choice group. Meanwhile, multi-choice Nigerian statement says it has not received any notification 
from FIRS, adding that it respects and complies uh, with the tax laws of Nigeria. Well, in the meantime, over the past few years, allocation from the Federation account to state government has been on the decline. Therefore, most state governments have had to rely on internally generated revenue to meet the growing demands for infrastructure and personnel costs. And expatriate Ex taxation uh, mm. has generated significant issues between the state governments and large corporations. And uh, due to the uh, the technicalities involved and the disjointed approach often adopted in resolving the same. Uso Obiano, uh, Associate Director, Tax Regulatory and People Services, KPMG Nigeria, will be discussing what both the state governments and companies need to know about expatriate taxation and how they should organize their affairs to avoid, uh, avoid the mines. That's next. Keep you here on Business Morning. All right, let's bring in uh, Uzo Obienu now to join us to look at um, some of these um, tax issues. Thank you very much, um, Sobienu, for joining us on the program. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. So tell us, what is the general legal framework for the taxation of expatriates in Nigeria? Okay, thank you. Um, expatriates, um, like every other person in Nigeria, um, that it's liable to tax in Nigeria. Um, it's expatriate taxation is governed by the Personal Income Tax Act as amended 2011. So just like every other person, expatriates fall under the Personal Income Tax as amended 2011. But it's important to note that um, the Personal Income Tax Act um, provides specific um, direction under the PE regulation on how everybody that is under the um, that ends employment income will be assessed to taxation. The PE regulation provides a form of advance of the taxes due from individuals who are taxable in Nigeria to the states, so that the states can at least carry on with their activities. And at the end of the year, individuals expatriates and other individuals in the country will have the opportunity to file a proper return three months from the end of the year. So for expatriates in, in employment, which is where most expatriates in Nigeria are under, they will be liable to their employment income under the PU regulation, which is a subsidiary re, um, legislation of the Personal Income Tax Act. All right, but what are the major minds around, you know, the taxation of expatriates in Nigeria? Okay, to, to, to start with, um, I would say that companies need to pay very serious attention to the issues of expatriate taxation. First, because um, when you start from the immigration, how expatriates come into Nigeria, there are certain mistakes that if you make from the immigration documentation, an expatriate that should not be ordinarily liable to tax in Nigeria becomes liable automatically. So it is the immigration mine, if I may call it that. So you need to navigate that properly. Then there is also the documentation mine. In my experience, I have seen expatriates and in fact companies because the, the truth of the matter is that the government appoints the companies as the agent of collection for employment income for expatriates that are tax resident in Nigeria. So when I say expatriates, I'm also talking about the company because the responsibility of deduction and remittance lies with the company. Companies who have not put in their acts together in terms of documentation and companies who do not have proper processes around the taxation of expatriates in-house often get their hands burnt because there are a number of issues that companies need to be aware of. First of all, I talked about documentation. Documentation right from um, the inception as to what exactly is the expatriate coming into Nigeria to do. What kind of documentation should he have in terms of immigration documentation that allows him to work? What about the returns, the monthly returns that are required on a monthly basis to ensure that 
the proper location is captured for such an expatriate. So it's all around the internal processes that companies need to have in place to ensure that the administration of expatriates is properly managed. Companies with very um, um, silo way of working in terms of the HR, the finance function, logistics, often get their hands burnt because information does not flow freely amongst them. And such information are critical in the taxation of expatriates. So information mine, documentation mine, um, 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 the immigration mine, and even you know, having a good understanding around the various aspects of the law that apply to those expatriates is also very critical for companies. So we need to be very well aware of all this as you, you know, administer expatriates and, you know, um, in your company. Yeah. So what are the conditions under which an expatriate will not be liable to tax in Nigeria? Okay, thank you. Very good question. So this, it's critical, right? Um, some companies for the sake of, um, you know, convenience, I want an expatriate in the country, but he's coming in here for just two weeks. He's going to be here for a business meeting. But because you, need, you quickly need to get him in and all that, you put him on what we call an expatriate quota position. Once such an expatriate occupies a quota position in Nigeria, he is deemed to hold the Nigerian employment. And by virtue of that alone, such an expatriate is already liable to tax in Nigeria. But then if you look at the law, the law makes provision for um, you know, the conditions under which an expatriate will may not be liable to tax in Nigeria. First of all, the law says that, look, if your the duties of your employment are exercised in Nigeria, but your cost really is not in Nigeria. That's one of the conditions. Mind you, these are joint conditions. There are three of them and they are joint conditions. If you, the duty of your employment, even though it's in, in Nigeria, but that cost does not reside in the Nigerian entity or any of, your, of the um, entities that are affiliated to the foreign entity, that you would have fulfilled the first condition. The second condition is if you're not in Nigeria for a period of 183 days, now, this 180 days includes period of temporary absence of leave or leave and, um, uh, and you know, short-term um, departure from the office. It includes all that. If you're not in the office for 183 days, that's another condition. If you meet that, you'll be fine. Now, the third one is the more difficult condition for a lot of expatriates. Now, Nigeria as a country has double taxation treaty with a number of companies. Our countries. So we, we, Nigeria also would like to be sure that that income is not, it's protected under the double taxation treaty agreement we have with your country. So if you are from a country where we have a GTT and you are in Nigeria for just about maybe 160 days and your cost is not borne by a Nigerian entity, then there'll be scope for you not to be liable to tax in Nigeria. Also, if you're just on a business visa, you have not necessarily come into Nigeria to work. So you will not be liable to tax in Nigeria. So taxation is really for expatriates. It's about whether you are working first, you must be working in Nigeria. If you also meet the three conditions that I've just um, exempted from taxation. Now, it's also important to note that this is speaking primarily to employment income. Where an expatriate in Nigeria that derives income in Nigeria has businesses in Nigeria, and as such is deemed to derive non-employment income in Nigeria, such income also will be liable to tax in Nigeria. All right, but expatriate is liable to you know, Nigerian tax on foreign sourced income. Okay, um, for expatriates that are resident in Nigeria and derive their employment income in Nigeria, they will not be liable to taxes on income they derive from foreign investments. So you are ring fenced, you are ring fenced your Nigerian operations, and that is what the Nigerian tax authority is focused on. If you have income derived from outside the Nigerian shores, 
that income will not be liable to tax in Nigeria to the extent that it is not incidental to your employment in Nigeria. Um, the last point I've just made is important because we have cases where people pay a certain portion of the income in Nigeria, employment income, and pay the other part of the income outside Nigeria for an employment that or for, for, for employment that is exercised in Nigeria that did not meet the three conditions I spoke about earlier. Such income, whether paid in US, in any country, to the extent that is incidental to that employment that is exercised in Nigeria and has not met the three conditions, will be liable to tax in Nigeria, regardless of where it is paid. Now, is there a, a win-win approach for the state government and the host companies? Yes, I would say so. Um, where the, the, the Nigerian companies have done the right thing in trying to put the docu right documentation in place, the right processes in place to ensure that um, the appropriate taxes are captured and remitted to the tax authorities. The tax authorities should reciprocate that gesture when it is time for audits and not necessarily assume that every company must have a tax liability. And it's also important to state that the, 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 the social contract between companies and, the, and in fact individuals and citizens and tax residents as patriots, I must say, uh, with the federal government and state governments is such that the public goods will need to be available to show that yes, the government is also keeping to their own side of the bargain. So it's really at the end of the day about the social contract and the trust inherent in that system, which we need to build and continue to rebuild so that taxpayers are more willing and able to make their taxes available as a when due. And then government on their own side are also very keen to use the taxes generated for the good of their economy. So that's where I would like to um, um, have that. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Uzo Obienu, thank you so much uh, for your time. Mr. Uzo Obienu is Associate Director, Tax Regulatory and People Services, KPMG in Nigeria. After the break, we turn our focus to the recently approved $982.729 billion supplementary budget for the 2021 fiscal year. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning. Well, the National Assembly approved the sum of 982.729 billion naira as supplementary budget for the 2021 fiscal year. The approved sum represents an upward review of 86.9 billion naira from the initial amount of 895.842 billion naira transmitted to the National Assembly by President Muhammadu Buhari about two weeks ago. Joining us now to look at this is Oladipo Ajayi, head fixed income at Chapel Hill. Dunham. Thank you very much, Edipo, for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. So what is your view on this uh, supplementary budget of about um, 890, which increased from 895.8 billion naira to 982.73 billion naira? Yeah, I think um, it's a very good one. If you look at the underlying uh, reasons why the budget was, uh, the supplementary budget was increased. And um, the reason cited by the uh, National Assembly was that uh, aside the, the uh, Nigeria Army, they feel that other security apparatus also need to be fortified, uh, considering the level of security challenges that we are currently going through. So as a result of that, they actually included the Navy, they included Nigerian police, they even included the EFCC and the TSS and other uh, police, uh, other security outfits um, in, in their budget, so as to actually upgrade their, uh, their, uh, their, their munitions for them. So that Nigeria will be able to actually combat the current uh, security challenge appropriately. So I think uh, it's a very good one because if they have decided to actually focus on um, Nigeria, I mean, of course, we have other issues that um, the other security apparatus also need to actually um, uh, curtail. 
and uh, without good um, good uh, preparation and good uh, ammunition, they will they will find it very difficult to actually do that. So I think it's a very right good work on the part of the national assembly. But this uh, increased supplementary budget means more borrowing on the part of the government. Uh, seems to be, you know, making the debt uh, situation more worrisome. Yeah, if you even if you go by um, the situations and things that we've been hearing from analysts in the past weeks about our level of debt, and even uh, if you look at the reports uh, released by the Minister of Finance recently, and when she was giving an, an highlight of, uh, of what happened between uh, January and May, we found that that uh, uh, cost of debt to 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 revenue. It's as high as ninety eight percent, and uh, that is actually very worrisome. Um, however, if you look at the current uh, the the composition of the supplementary budget, you and I will agree that uh, they are very very necessary. And uh, on top of the list, top of the list is the COVID nineteen vaccine. And if you look at um, the the uh, the new uh, variant that's currently emerging uh, uh, other other countries, we think I think that we need to agree for ourselves. And I think that is actually very, very urgent. We need to handle that as well. If you look at the, the current security challenge that we're going through, we need to actually uh, walk around that. Um, we've seen issues where people in the north cannot go to school so easily. So we need to walk around those things and that they are very, very necessary at such a time as this. So uh, as we speak, we don't have the revenue to actually do much. So borrowing to actually do uh, much, uh, I think uh, it's very, very necessary. Now, the Minister of Finance presented the 2022-2024 MTEF and the FSP at the FEC meeting on Wednesday. Uh, what's your take on the three-year plan? Uh, looking at the three-year plan, I think um, it's a very proactive thing to do because uh, if you don't have uh, a plan, there's nothing to work with. And then uh, looking at the plan for 2022, um, it's, uh, it's proposed that we'll, we'll generate revenue of about 6.5 trillion and uh, also from VAT about 2.6 trillion. Um, and um, the totality of the budget for 2022 is about 14.41 trillion. And uh, also on the, on the budget itself, so we're still running a deficit budget for 2022, and it's about 5.6 uh, um, to 3. And uh, if you look at the totality of what the only thing that's of concern to me, it's also the borrowing. So it means that we'll further um, exacerbate the current uh, borrowing status. And, uh, but we also need to also look at it from this angle what is the borrowing for? If the borrowing is for um, development in the boring for capital um, project. I think um, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very uh, necessary for us to actually grow uh, our baseline. And at the same time, I think also the government also um, also needs to actually look at offshore and options like uh, partnering uh, with um, a private organizations to actually do uh, invest in um, infrastructural projects. Um, going to bilateral agreements, uh, multilateral agreements, uh, we, we also need to actually uh, um, um, adopt uh, that, uh, that strategy to actually reduce the debt uh, body in our house. Because looking at it, it seems the government is actually serving themselves only with the uh, responsibility to actually develop and create infrastructure project. I think um, they also need to actually look at other, other ways. If you look at uh, the um, it's a very loud project, and it's not, um, the government is not confident at the fund directly, but they might be patched with it. But we have to order and look for a um, um, very lofty way to actually um, develop the, the country and find a way to reduce our, our expenditure. But also, the Minister of Finance projects increase in revenue generated from 6.54 trillion in 2022 to about 9.15 trillion in 2022, in 2023. Considering the you know current status in the country, do you think this is achievable? Yes, um, if we look at it from the handle, there was a report released by. Uh, one of the international uh, monetary uh, agents, uh, agency where uh, it was stated that um, um, Nigeria is currently losing close to 10 trillion uh, on a money and a basis uh, from um, a 
as a result of um, uh, lack of power, power, power supplies to, to Nigeria. But I think uh, what that means is that if we can, to some extent, look at a way to actually develop that sector, we can uh, we can actually scope well up to like maybe even if it's just going to be fifty percent of that. That's close to a five trillion. If you can have five trillion to our existing uh, revenue generation capacity, that will take us even far above uh, what is actually projected. So what that simply means is that we have a lot of, of, of opportunities to actually do this. So it's just that um, the government is looking what and look at the way to actually do that. And also, um, there are not much a lot of people in the tax net. Uh, so the government also needs to find a way to bring a lot of people into the tax net. And one of the ways to do it is actually um, by development, developing and also giving people um, necessary infrastructure that they need to actually carry out their business. And as businesses strive, they will also, also culminate into their revenue generation on the part of the government. So I think that this is very possible if we are very, very proactive about it. Now, the parliament <coughs> approved um, foreign borrowing of about uh, $6.18 billion. How would you judge their decision? What they actually did was actually to confirm what is actually highlighted in the budget already. But just, uh, but I think um, uh, what they did is currently in the current stance, uh, it's okay because uh, we also need the uh, FX revenue to actually boost our, our reserve and be able to actually meet obligations, our donor denominated obligations uh, um, as a country. So um, the, 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 the range is simply is about 3 billion to 6.18 billion that uh, the government can actually raise international market. Although the Minister of Finance also mentioned that one of the reasons why they were adopting adopt that strategy is uh, to actually reduce the cost of borrowing. And uh, to me, I think uh, that will only reduce the cost of borrowing in the short term. Because if you look at, for example, imagine um, 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 euro bonds issued in 2015 and uh, compare that with now, compare the cost of cost of servicing the, the, the instrument in 2015 with now. So it's almost three times the cost at which we are servicing in, in three in, uh, in, in like five, six years ago. So in the short term, it looks like a, like a very good way to actually borrow because of the rates now. But if you want to now look at that, the performance of Naira over time, uh, it will actually put uh, a much more burden on the government uh, to actually service such, uh, such laws in, in the future. And um, I also understand the part of the government uh, to actually go offshore to borrow. Another reason is to actually reduce uh, the crowding of the local market so as to encourage uh, private uh, organizations to actually um, partake in the local market to actually raise more. So oh, I think it's a very good one overall uh, on the part of, of, of the initial because what that will simply means is that it helps uh, Nigeria to reach its foreign obligations uh, uh, better. Yeah, so how, how would you expect the fixed income market to react to these approvals uh, by the National Assembly?
All right, uh, thank you so much. For <coughs> to, uh, leave it there now. Oladipo Waja is the head fixed income Chapel Hill Denim. Thank you for your time on Business Morning. All right, uh, time for opening calls to the market with Aniete Edet. Uh, looks like uh, profit taking was the uh, move yesterday. We saw the market dip. How's it going? Yeah, good morning, Ladi. Yes, yes, like you rightly said, uh, profit taking or mild profit taking was the order of the day yesterday, and that came after a four day, you know, consecutive. Uh, well, if you can, four days if you come from Friday last week down to um, Wednesday of this week. So we had. Uh, we've been making gains, but yesterday we had just a 0.08% pullback from on the all share index. Although we are still in the positive uh, uh, um, territory for the market, we're still up about 1.5% uh, on the all share index and still very much within the 38,000 mark. But yesterday we lost um, about 27 billion, era, and that was due to sell pressure on some banking stocks uh, such as Access Bank. UBA, and then, all, of course, when you take a look at the sectoral performance there, it shows you that uh, that counter was down by nearly 1%, 0.90% is what it printed. Consumer goods sector was also down at 0.14%. Uh, of course, insurance sector, although that one has just a mild amount of capitalization there. But, of course, the losses there was, was moderated by the oil and gas sector, which went up by 1.21%. Industrial goods also mitigated losses. Then in terms of sectoral performance, um, and, and the activity, we were not much, not much of that um, volume was um, um, achieved yesterday. Only the value was up. But now to bring us up to speed with what is going on at the equities markets, uh, uh, well, at the, the very first um, few hours of today, let's talk to Tajuddin Olayinka, who's a stockbroker at Vamo Securities. Uh, so thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Tajuddin. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. No, okay. Now, I'm sure you're not. Um, are you impressed or are you, what's, what's your feeling about uh, yesterday's um, pullback on the market? I'm sure you would, we would expect that the market will be going uptrend. But um, can you bring us up to speed with uh, activities at the market at the moment? Yeah, uh, what happened yesterday was just uh, normal, normal thing that, you know, that you follow a, you know, a very strong uh, bullish uh, run. Uh, market, of course, uh, investors would take their usual profits and then, of course, prepare for the next rally. So what happened yesterday was not unusual. It was just a normal thing that should happen when, 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 when some stocks have been in their prices. Uh, so uh, right now, market is, 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 is a bit down. Uh, it's, uh, it's, having, it's on the negative side. But, of, of course, at this, at this hour, it is too early to call. So uh, we have uh, about zero, minus 0 0.11. So that's, that's, that's uh, not something to... Uh, to really worry about uh, because uh, uh, as we as we as we move as we move along, you know, in, in the course of trading today, we might see a difference. But well, really, investors are still, you know are still taking their profit, and it's, it's quite normal. Okay, so now before before I let you go, let me just ask you one more question: um, What stocks or what sector do you think is going to drive some kind of movement, whether upward or downward, today? Well, uh, you know, usually. The bullish run is supported by banking stocks, especially when their results are coming out. So, you, you know, if, if you look at what happened in Venice and few other stuff like UGT, you see that those movements, uh, those those movements were expected, and those movements were, you know, and the to the immediate reaction to those movements were also expected. So, you know, what we what, what we move the market is 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 is, is the banking stocks. Banking stocks, you know, drive rally and. Uh, of course, you know, if you look at also, uh, uh, some, some of these different companies, they also support the rallies most times. So, uh, we have that banking stock, it's banking stock to take the lead. Once banking stock take the lead, you see the other, the other market and the other sectors coming, you, 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 know, you, you know, falling in line. Okay. Okay, so, so thank you for that update uh, at the market, um, Tajuddin. Okay, so Tajuddin at uh, Stockburg, uh, um, uh, Valmont Securities. Okay, so now let's move over to the smaller um, unlisted securities market. It was down for a second day yesterday. 0.72% was what it printed yesterday. And of course, the volume of shares, uh, the volume of stocks traded there was just 1.46 uh, million units. And then of course, we had the number of deals was increased by 12. Um, uh, we had 41 against 29. And then of course, the number of traded stocks there was six against four recorded in the previous session. Then moving over to the debt uh, market, we had uh, the not, not much of activity still bearish there. And of course, 
Number of, uh, total, number of, total number of deals there, 15. Moving over to the treasury bills market where the, uh, the, the CBN conducted uh, a, 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 like a treasury uh, uh, bills uh, auction uh, almost with their weekly auction yesterday. So the, we saw not much of activities there. Number of deals traded was just eight. So investors are still uh, kind of being quiet at, the, at that market. Moving over to the CBN special bills, no activity there, nil across the board, especially on that particular uh, paper there, the 30th of August, 2021. And then, of course, for the OMO, where, which I, I, I talked about, 20, 23 number of deals. So now, for that market, it's still a wait and see game for investors there. And then, of course, um, we, with the weekend, we can only put our eyes out for the outcome next week, you know, uh, for, for traders. So now, but to give us an update at yesterday's weekly OMO auction, let's talk to uh, Dumebi Udegunam, who is a head of fixed income at UBA. Thank you for joining us, sir, Dumebi. Good morning. Hmm. Okay, so now um, we had uh, the CBN conduct its weekly uh, OMO auction, uh, which was about um, 17 billion naira, uh, you know, it, 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 at, the, at the auction. So now, was there any... Um, like, uh, mop up at the uh, treasury bills market. Um, well, the OMO auction actually was quite a quiet one. With only 20 billion being offered and 17 billion being sold, 17 billion being mopped up. This clear, this should be clear sign that there's no really activity or appetite for the OMO auction bills. Although this is the first um, OMO auction we had in over two weeks. So it was a very quiet one, which we all maintained at 7 at the 89-day bill, 8.5 at the 159, and 10.1 at the 48 bill. So the rates did not change. However, they mopped up lower compared to the previous auctions we had two weeks ago. Okay, so now what's your outlook as we approach another week? We've ended the first week of uh, July, so we're approaching the second week of July. So what's your outlook for the um, fixed income market next week? Well, next week we have a lot of liquidity coming in. We have a bond maturity on the 15th of We tell about 561 billion maturing. We also have a mobile maturity of 20 billion on the 13th and a NCB maturity of 109 billion. So altogether we have about 700 billion coming to the system. So we expect a very liquid market next week, which will spur bullish sentiment in the market and further causing marginal decline in yields. Okay, so thank you for that update, uh, Dumebi. Thanks for having me. Okay, so, Ladi, I don't know it's what's your well. pick, whether the fixed <laughs> uh, income market, the debt, the uh, well, equities market. Well, I think them? fingers crossed for the you know equities market close, uh, weekly close for today. Uh, let's see if uh, profit taking will continue. All right, Nisa, thank you for the update. All right, we'll take another quick break. When we come back, we do an opening call to London. That's in a moment. Do stay with us. All right, let's cross over to London now and talk to Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Well, starting with data, the UK's recovery from the pandemic slowed in May, despite the latest easing of lockdown restrictions boosting hospitality venues. Tell us more. Good morning, Chimaze. Yeah, um, I think there has been a lot of um, uh, shocks in within the square mile today as we've got this GDP uh, figures for May showing that the economy grew 0.8% at that time, much lower than what had been forecast of 1.5% and still much lower than the 2% that we uh, saw in April. I think everybody's putting their hopes, well, certainly the Treasury and the Bank of England, on a Q2 uh, recovery to bring back as some of those uh, pandemic losses last year, the economy contracted by 10 percent. But a 0 0.8 percent uh, does show that perhaps um, growth is slowing here in the UK. It is the fourth consecutive month of growth. But if you consider the fact that in May uh, people were able to eat indoors, um, uh, the economy really was pretty much uh, fully open. It is um, a concern uh, to economists. One of the biggest uh, contractions has come from the manufacturing industry. We've been speaking on this show for the past couple of weeks 
speaks about uh, the, the global shortage of chips. Um, you know, uh, chips uh, cannot be produced fast enough across the world. And that has really affected the auto industry here in the UK. A couple of big plants have had to slow or even halt some production of getting cars out. That's been shown in the data released by the Office for National Statistics today. A little bit of an uptick in the services sector. No surprises there as uh, people are starting to go out and eat out. Um, this is uh, lifted um, that sector, particularly uh, when it comes to um, hospitality and hotels. Their um, uh, revenues have increased by 37 uh, percent. And in a whole, uh, May has been picked up by retail sales. Retail sales are strong. Lots of people have been heading out. Um, uh, so they have been purchasing. But all in all, um, I think it has uh, you know, raised some eyebrows. And it's certainly for uh, the short term anyway, has, um, I think, uh, allayed some fears about uh, the potential tightening up of monetary policy and the quantitative easing programme, which stands at over £800 billion in this country. And Lourdes Bank's insurance arm has been fined £90 million for sending insurance renewal letters to customers suggesting they were getting a competitive price without backing up the claim. Any response yet from Lourdes? Yeah, we have had a response. Um, their spokesperson has said, we're sorry we got this wrong and um, that it's improved its process in the light of um, the Financial Conduct Authority's um, investigation. Uh, the consumer regulator has been looking into, um, I believe it was about a, a series of eight years where Lloyd's uh, was sending uh, renewal claims to about uh, three million uh, customers. So far, 300,000 of them have received uh, compensation to the tune of over uh, three million pounds. They're basically told that if they renewed their insurance with Lloyd's, it would be the most competitive um, option. Um, and it was good for them. And uh, many of them, uh, many of these uh, consumers fell hook, line and sinker for that line. Why wouldn't they? It's come from Lloyd's. Um, but in actual fact, it was wrong. You know, it wasn't competitive. They could have got deals elsewhere. And following a probe, FCA found that um, even Lloyd's were uh, mis-selling uh, their products. So they have re received this fine. And again, they've taken responsibility by apologising. Hmm. Well, we'll still talk to you again later in the day on Business Incorporated. And then we'll say thank God this Friday. Mm, I can't wait. Thanks, Jimmy. Sure. Okay, let's look at the crypto market. Well, Laddie, is it a red or green day today? Well, uh, it's uh, more like a mixture. We have uh, just Bitcoin in the green this morning mm -hmm. and uh, major altcoins all in the red. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, we have Doge actually in the green this morning and stable coins, uh, most stable coins in the green. Market cap, $1.38 trillion, down about 1.97%. And we have a 24-hour volume at 8 a.m. this morning. Uh, $77.48 billion traded in the total crypto market. Bitcoin dominance uh, inching up a little bit there at 44.92%. Uh, uh, let's uh, take a look at the uh, price of Bitcoin this morning, 32998 It got as low as $32,133 uh, this morning. 24-hour uh, volume traded in Bitcoin, $28.45 billion traded. Look at the... Uh, the chart here, the four-hour chart, we saw that recovery there, uh, but it's still uh, looking weak around the lower Bollinger Band. Uh, let's uh, talk to Michael and Naji now, Digital Market Analyst. Hello, Michael. Hey, good morning, Laddie. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. Thank God it's Friday. But uh, tell me about this Ethereum uh, London upgrade and, you know, what is gonna, how it's going to impact the price and the total crypto market. Yeah, so the uh, the Ethereum London hard fork is going to basically be a monetary uh, ch a change in the monetary policy of Ethereum. And what I mean by that is right now, the way Ethereum uh, settles transactions is what happens is if you need to send a transaction, your transaction is actually sent through a um, auction method. And what I mean by that is uh, right now, if you want to send ETH from another person to another person, whether it's an ERC-20 token or whatever it is, you your fee, your transaction fee, is is set by via auction model. So it's not actually set in stone. So what, what happens now is the reason why we see those $100, $200 gas fees for sending transactions is because what happens is when, it's, when there's a lot of people using Ethereum, people are basically... Uh, 
what they're doing is they're bidding up the price. So there's a bidding war. So it's not very efficient. And what EIP 1559 basically is going to do is it's going to make the fee model more predictable. So there's two aspects to it. One is the, the base fee. So the base fee is basically a fee that's going to be calculated by the network. And in order for you to send your transaction on the network, the, the protocol, the Ethereum protocol will give you what's called a base fee. And what, no matter what happens, as long as you pay the base fee, your transaction will go through. So that's way more predictable than what we have right now. Because right now, you can send a transaction and it won't go through, but you lose your gas fees. Another, another thing that was added is what's called a tip fee. And the tip fee, basically what that does is if you want your transaction sent faster, you just tip. And then that way, your transaction gets moved ahead of the block. It's almost like you're incentivizing them to take your transaction faster. Now, the most important thing about EIP-1559 is that base fee is actually going to be burned. So by every single time someone sends a Ethereum transaction, the base fee will be burned. And so that in turn, the hope is it makes Ethereum deflationary. And so by doing that, you have less units of Ethereum. And so that makes it, the hope is it's going to make Ethereum, quote unquote, harder money because of the lesser supply. So basically, EIP-1559 is a hope that Ethereum will be more predictable. And also, it's going to become harder money because the fees will be burnt. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, for the price, uh, you, uh, the, 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 what people are expecting is something like the halvening effect. So they're, they're going to see like a supply shock because the Ethereum is getting burnt. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, the hope is it's, it's a catalyst for price for us to keep, uh, to go higher on ETH. Okay. Well, uh, we have uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is looking quite uh, weak uh, this morning. What do you think is pushing sentiment? I think I think uh, a lot of sentiment is just uh, beaten, you know, beaten down. Um, people right. have lost about fifty to sixty percent of their net worth <laughs> in cryptocurrencies in the last one to two months. So number. it's very natural to see market participants just bored. And for lack of a better term, they just don't have the demand appetite anymore. So, um, like you said last week, I, I, I think we're going down to 16, 18K. It's not a matter of, like, you know, if, but a matter of when and how do we get there. Um, mm. But for, 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 for everything, all, all purposes included, I, I, I think we go lower. I think we go much lower. And all, like, there might be a relief rally to the 40K. Mm. Um, because we have dropped a lot, uh, but fundamentally we're definitely going we're definitely going lower. What do you think um, nothing's will a certainty, to the shorts? But what do you think will happen to the shorts? I think right now I think right now there's there's a hu there's a huge potential for a rally back up to 40k and about three thousand dollars on Ethereum. Uh, let's going back to three thousand dollars on Ethereum uh, because we're just so oversold. Um, so I think the shorts could be in profit, uh, you know, sometime later, not now. Um, <laughs> okay. But the, definitely there could be, a, a, you know, some kind of squeeze coming in. I could see that um, to about like 35K, 36K. Okay. Well, but, you know, even though there's a downturn, you know, there are always those um, old coins that kind of, you know, outperform. Which ones do you... Yeah, uh, this week, yeah, know? this week we've seen, we've seen Axie Infinity. The, the symbol is AX, AX, uh, AXS. Uh, it's a digital, um, I believe it's a digital uh, NFT project out of Vancouver. And so that, that, that is their token. Um, it's, it's shown explosive growth. And the number one reason for that is because um, it's hit all-time highs against Bitcoin. So it's, it's essentially like it's, it, it, the, the loss that we had in the past two months hasn't happened to Axie Infinity. It's mm -hmm. one of those coins that has shown resilience. And, you know, you always want to find that in times like this because when we start going up again, those coins will give you like, you know, 20, 30, 100 X returns, mm, just like the, Chainlink back in the, the bear, 17 the bear, to 19. Bear market insurance, I guess. <laughs> yes, okay. exactly. It's a bear market. It's spot on. It's a bear market insurance. All right. All right, Michael. Thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much, laddie. Have a great weekend. You too. All right. Uh, Chimmy, top odds by market cap, BNB down. Uh, the biggest uh, loser there is uh, Dogecoin uh, this morning. And the biggest gainer? Well, biggest gainer, yeah. You know, I told you I was watching ZRX, and there yeah. it is there. ZRX up 8.54%. Uh, Interesting. Top and then gainer we're, Yeah, we're in going into market. the weekend now. So uh, should we be watching ZRX then? Oh, yes. My eyes on ZRX. This, okay. This is already a sign that, you know, we're on the right path. But mind you, this is not a financial advice <laughs> anyway. Okay, that's it on the program for today. And, of course, for the week, thank you for being part of it. 
I'm Chimeze Obi. And mind you, don't forget to join us by 1.30 in the afternoon on Business Incorporated for more updates on developments in the world of business. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Enjoy your weekend.